Okay. All right, so let's go over this again. So what I did is I drew a basic set of cerebral hemispheres. I drew what was uh, the idea of a diencephalon, knowing that as, as my cerebral hemispheres got bigger, I'll have my basal ganglia out here, which are my caudate nuclei and the globus pallidus and the putamen. And, and in that is where we're going to create these spaces because we've got these nuclei and we've got this pet potential space that's always been there, but it was a single tube and then we're stretching everything out. So these tubes, these, these uh, spaces are going to generate cerebral spinal fluid because they have epidermal, epidermal cells and choroid plexuses. And that's what makes cerebral spinal fluid. So that cerebral spinal fluid will enter into left and right lateral ventricle. And they'll drain through the interventricular foramen into the third ventricle. Everybody follow? And from the third ventricle, you'll have added cerebral spinal fluid because the epithalamus also has a choroid plexus with epidermal cells that will produce cerebral spinal fluid. Where is cerebral spinal fluid coming from? Oh, that's the fluid that's bathing all the neurons, guys. You understand? And the epidermal cells are actively taking what was bathing the neurons with what the neurons stuck out there in terms of metabolic waste, and they're taking it and they're pumping it into these ventricles. Did you hear me? The metabolic waste and the signals that need to go into bloodstream from brain are going through the cerebral spinal fluid, guys. Did you hear me? This is important. This is why this stuff needs to go back into the brain. So... The fluid inside the brain, if it has to go back into the blood, right, to go to other organs for the purpose of signaling to them, and I apologize, I said I meant, I meant blood, not brain. Earlier. So the brain produces metabo met metabolic waste, produces hormones that need to get into blood so that they can only transport it into this fluid that was bathing them at one point and pump it out into this space is called the ventricles. And the lateral ventricles with the third ventricle and the fourth ventricle are going to generate this cerebral spinal fluid. That cerebral spinal fluid has to leave because it's got to get back into the blood. How do I get it back into blood? My God, I make it so I have it leak out from inside the brain so now that it's bathing the brain. But sure enough, we said, well, the PMI is in direct contact with the brain. And then the arachna matter... Is surrounding the brain. Everybody see that? So in between there, in between the pia mater and the arachna mater is the sub -arach arachnoid space. Now, in the spinal cord, guys, the arachna mater, sub -arach so this is the arachna mater, the red is the arachna mater. Arachnoid and noid means light. So arachnoid means like spider. So sure enough, it looks like spider web. When you go to dissect it, it looks like spider web. So now, in the spinal cord, guys, so the spinal cord sits in the vertebral column. Everyone agree? And the arachna matter is gonna be pushed up, up against the dura matter. You understand? So the dura matter is the is the, again the, these are the bags guys, my bag, these are the bags. You got me? I took my my bottle, put it in my bag. I take my brain and my spinal cord and I put it in my bag. So my bag is the dura meninges. You got me? <laughs> and then so let me see. I got another color here, purple. It's so, all right. <laughs> so here, guys, the purple is in direct contact. And what we don't realize is that it has it has a hint of blue. That's part of it. But here's what's interesting: when it gets up into the skull, the purple will come off and stay as the dural. Sorry as the paras steel dura 
Okay? And the hint of blue... Well, let me, let me show you in an area where it would be more... It, it would be more... Uh, make more sense. So does everybody see that that's the junction between cerebellum and cerebral hemispheres? Does everybody see that? See my little crappy drawing? Cerebellum, cerebral hemispheres. So anywhere where you have this division and the separation of these lobes, the little blue is going to come off and dive with the arachnomatter. The little blue is going to dive off and dive with the arachnomatter. Do you see that? And the purple is going to stay stuck to the bone. So what do we call, what do we call the, so, okay. So let me, let me label it now. Let me label it. Let me see if I have my black marker, thin black marker. So this whole thing right here is referred to as the dura matter. But the purple part in the skull separates, and it's called the perosteal layer versus the blue one which is the meningeal layer. Now watch what happens. When the meningeal layer separates from the perosteal layer, when the purple and blue separate, where the there's differences in the brain structures, right? Then the arachnomatter can do this. Watch, guys. So everybody see? I punched through that thinner layer of the dura matter. This only happens in the brain. You get me? This only happens in brain. And so what winds up happening is, let me let me just, I want to make sure I, I label this so you guys can see it clearly. So you have your dura matter, but your dura matter is made up of two layers in the skull, not in spinal cord, but in the skull. You got me? And there's a reason for that. Because the cerebral spinal fluid that exits here, guys, is going to be between the brain and the and the arachnoid matter in the subarachnoid space, but when it gets up to the brain, what happens? Does everybody see? It's like one of those simple puzzle mazes. Look, here's my cerebral spinal fluid in the subarachnoid space. Everyone agree? But when I get up into the brain, my parosteal dura separate from my meningeal dura, and my arachnoid matter has broken through. So this. They call that the dural venous sinuses, guys. You hear me? And that real red fisticuff there. So look, that whole thing is the sinus. And that little fisticuff of arachnoid matter, that's called the arachnoid villi. Sure enough, these arachnoid villi, guys, they are what allow cerebral spinal fluid to leave and enter into the dural venous sinuses. And the dural venous sinuses will drain back into the venous system. Into what? Into left and right internal jugular veins. Guys, what will happen if I don't have these arachnoid villi? Fluid would accumulate in the subarachnoid space. You see that, guys? And that fluid will then push the dura matter and the bones further from the, themselves so that the skull cap doesn't, doesn't form. What is that disease called? No, meningitis is when the meninges swell. I'm gonna tell you. I'm gonna tell you a case about that one in a moment. This one. So when there's no arachnoid villi, guys, 
It's called hydrocephalus. When you have a decrease in arachnoid villi, then fluid accumulates, and the, the little babies, they look like Megamind. Right, the little blue guy with the big head? That's what they look like. Look like Megamind. Real basic. All you got to do, put a tube into the subarachnoid space and drain it directly to the jugular, into internal jugular veins. So you put a tube from here to here. And as they grow, you put a bigger tube in. And the head will shrink. And they'll be normal. Why is it that they don't have mental problems? Why is it they don't die? Because that does not happen when I'm born. You agree? Or before birth. This happens after birth. The hardening of the skull happens after birth. Yes? That's why they're, they're, not, they're not dead. Because if, if we were born with skulls that were solidified, then any fluid that would accumulate would push the brain right through. You understand? So hydrocephalus, if it occurs in an adult, would kill them. Do you hear me? It'll take the medulla and it'll push it because right here is where the foramen magnum is. So any fluid that would accumulate, guys, in this subarachnoid space in an adult where there's no expansion, there's no expansion, there's no space for expansion. The skull cap is fused. It's hard. There's no room for expansion. You start gaining fluid in that subarachnoid space because you don't have arachnoid granulations or arachnoid villi then the fluid is going to accumulate, and what it's going to do, it's going to push the brain right through the floor of the skull, guys. And the medulla is right there, and the centers of respiration are right there. It means you stop breathing. You understand? Uncle herniation. You'll stop breathing. Trauma to the head. Would that increase fluid? So a, a dural, a, a, an epidural hematoma, a subdural hematoma, okay? Blood leaking directly into the mass, a mass effect, blood leaking directly into neural tissue. Any fluid in an adult brain, guys, not separate of the inflammatory response, the inflammatory response to the spilling of blood in, so imagine my blood brain barrier breaks. I, I get into an accident and blood vessels in my brain, they shred and blood literally leaks into my brain because my blood brain barrier is gone. What's going to happen if I don't die right on the spot? My brain's going to swell because I have a whole bunch of blood products that don't belong there that now have to be mopped up, removed, and then you have to try to repair what's left of the brain. See why I'm going to have deficits, guys? Now I'm, I'm gonna give you I'm gonna give you a case scenario. So I get a, I get again. This always comes my way. Uh, my wife has a friend that lives in a different area of the country. She's got a dog. Dog suddenly lost the eyesight. Okay, interesting. I'm thinking, all right, bet. Guys, our eyes. You know, as as supermanish as we think we all are. Okay, I can tell you that there are bacteria and viruses that target neuro, uh, cranial nerves one and two because they're direct connections to the brain. Okay, direct connections to the brain. If they can get in there, and they can go right back to the brain and infect it. You follow? Met, uh, viruses and bacteria that irritate the lining, the linings, the linings are called. Right? They irritate the line and they call that meningitis. So you have viral meningitis and you have bacterial meningitis. You to follow? If you swell the meninges enough, so sure enough, there was a study last year. I, I don't know if I told you this. Maybe this was, no, this was my last year's class. So in August, Scientific America, they came out with um, information about the meninges. So I used to think that they were just a bag. That it was just a bag for, for the brain, spinal cord. Just a bag. That's it. With the three layers, the dura mater, and then the pia mater directly in there, and then the arachnoid mater. So one, two, three. Tell me, guys. Well, you say, well, no, it's, the, the dura mater is just it's just connective tissue, fibrous connective tissue, nothing more than that. No, they found out that in the dura meninges there are lymphatic cells, immune cells, and those immune cells 
are communicating with the brain on a regular basis and the brain with them to let them know that everything is okay. So instead of having lymph nodes in the brain, we don't need them. And we got lymph, we got lymphatic tissue. We got lymphatic cells surrounding the, the entire brain within the meninges that cover it. Very interesting. It's very interesting. Why? Why, why so interesting? Because if the brain swells, or, or if we try to prevent the brain from swelling due to injury, well then the first set of cells we should be targeting is those immune cells that are relaying that information back and forth to the neurons. Can we mimic, can we, ma can we mask certain signals that the neurons would be sending to the immune cells saying that, hey, I'm damaged? And can we then alter and, and increase the number of signals that the neurons are sending to the white blood cells to say, hey, come help? And, and, and can that aid us in being able to finally fix portions of the brain, finally, and spinal cord? We don't know. But that's where we're going. You understand, guys? That's where we're going. So it's important to understand this stuff. Okay? So again, for review, cerebral spinal fluid that's generated inside the tube, inside my water bottle, is generated by epidermal cells in the core plexuses of the lateral ventricles, the third ventricle, and the fourth ventricle. Lateral ventricles drain to the third ventricle through the interventricular foramen. The third ventricle drains into the fourth ventricle through the cerebral aqueduct, which is found in the midbrain. And the, the, the lateral and median apertures are found at e their exit points found in the fourth ventricle for the purpose of allowing cerebral spinal fluid that's generated constantly by brain tissue to then escape the internal structure so it can then bathe it. So that means the brain is on vacation all the time. What do I mean by that? When I say the brain is on vacation all the time, it's, it's sitting in a pool of its own fluid, man. It's just chill. It's like at the pool all day. And then, now, now this really will hit home. The most, the most smartest people in the world are using about 10% of their brain. Hmm? Maybe 15. Smartest people, 15. Imagine what we can do, right? If we could use more of it. There's that whole idea of Lucy movie. Right, right. Where she, they, she takes a drug and it enhances, and as she, as 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 her, as her brain's ability becomes more enhanced, then she she can do more stuff with her mind and doesn't have to do stuff physically. You know what I mean? That that's the in theory. That's what they say. You know, if we could get there, in theory, they say that it's possible that we can actually communicate through telepathy and be able to move things with our minds. Like if we had all the ability, all the capabilities that our brains are capable of. Yeah, I mean, it's just theory. It's just theory. There's no proof behind it. Yeah. What's the what? What's limiting? What's limiting? We don't know. I mean, maybe conquering space travel. So if we can, you know, if we can start to tap into that, you know, all that, all that's, that the brain is capable of, we may be able to figure out how to fly from planet to planet. Yeah, like Star Trek or Star Wars. Yeah, for real, for real. You know, maybe we figure out the, the the beginnings of the cosmos itself, or find a new cosmos. Yeah. So this is how we get that fluid back, guys. Because once that fluid gets, once that fluid again leaves this, leaves my bottle, well, my bottle, which is my brain and spinal cord, it's leaky. So I'm gonna put it in the bag. It's on vacation, means it's in the pool all day. It's got its own little personal pool and it's in there all the time. Floating in its own secretion. You got me? But that's not enough because that secretion contains hormones and metabolic waste that the, neuro that, the, that the neurons of the brain are demanding that they get it back to the bloodstream to tell other organs what to do. So sure enough, up in the brain, the thickest layer, the outermost layer, the thickest layer, the outermost layer is going to split into two. And the one that's weaker is closer to the arachnoid matter. And the arachnoid matter being, arachnoid matter being stronger with these fisticuffs, granulations will punch through 
that weaker, thinner layer of the dura mater. Mm -hmm. And because they separated to create the dura vita senses, then that's how the cerebral spinal fluid back into circulation. Why? Because I can't have fluid in the brain. Didn't I tell you that? I can't have accumulation of fluid in the brain. I can't have excess fluid accumulation in the brain. You got me? Fluid, excess fluid accumulation in an adult brain will and or can and will result in death if you don't tap it. Right? That means putting a drill bit right to somebody's skull and putting several holes in there to then remove a portion of the skull to alleviate the pressure that's there because if not, they're going to die in front of you. Right? And it'll be their medulla getting pushed through the floor of the skull. No fluid, no excess fluid accumulation can occur in an adult brain, guys. Because there's no space for it. You got me? Very important. Yes? The other day, I saw a video of the other party, and it sounds like a part of Changes in pressure? Mm hmm. Because that's a direct, that fontanelle going up and down, it's because there's no bone there. So that's where the dura matter and the arachno matter are being pushed up against each other. And then right down the middle, you got that. So the dural sinuses, there's a list of them, guys. The dural sinuses, venous sinuses, there's superior sagittal sinus, inferior sagittal sinus, transverse sinus, right? And then uh, I think it's the, the yeah, transverse sinus. And then there's this other one, six, straight sinus, which comes from here, goes straight back. And then there's this S-shaped one, the sigmoidal sinus. That's the one that will directly drain into the internal jugular veins. So you look, you look those sinuses up in your textbook, guys, okay? You see they're all part of that bigger family of dural venous sinuses. The whole idea of these sinuses is to get that cerebral spinal fluid back into the venous system and back into the internal jugular veins. Once it's back into the internal jugular vein, back to heart. Heart then kicks it out the lung. Lung oxygenates it. Mixes it in with blood from from the lower lower abdominal cavity, which the liver is donating glucose to. So now you've got this mixed blood with hormones and metabolizing. So it's coming back. It's getting oxygenized. It's going it's going to get kicked out by left side blood once it leaves lung. It goes to the left side blood. I mean left side uh, heart. Left side heart kicks it out. <clears throat> left and right lung feeds left side heart. So left side heart squeezes, kicks it out. Left side heart then feeds the organs. Sure enough, one of those organs is the kidneys. Okay? Kidney's gonna take the oxygen, take the glucose, get rid of the metabolic waste. Okay? See how that works? It's how we design, guys. And that's why I'm here. I'm here to teach you this. All right? I'm here to try to help you visualize this stuff because there, you can't learn this any other way. You really can't. It, some of it has to be committed to memory forever, and the only way to really do that is one, Review it enough times. Two, teach it to someone else. Three, visualize it. Draw it. That's why you got the homework with the diagrams, learning the structures. Okay? That's why those of you, well, those of you don't have any lab, right? So there's a reason why there's a lab component to this class. All right? So you can learn the structures in lab. Just that the professors aren't teaching you. So it kind of sucks you having to teach yourself. Any questions on this, guys? So in closing, arachnoid granulations are going to allow cerebral spinal fluid to enter into the dural venous sinuses. Okay? And that's straight out of your textbook. The pictures will be much prettier. Okay? Much, much prettier. Um, all right. Any questions on this at all? Anything? Any confusions? Any clarifications? Any other? Okay. I'm going to erase it. It is going to be taken. Okay, so now, big picture, big picture, all right? So here, I'm going to draw my cerebral hemispheres again, my Mickey Mouse ears. This time what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw my diencephalon, and I'm going to call it D. Sorry, it's too big. Okay? And what's under the diencephalon, guys? 
Looks right under the dying cell one. Midbrain. Right? And what's right under the midbrain? Pond. And the medulla. And on the back side, cerebellum. So when I go to draw those cerebral hemispheres, they gotta be much bigger. Everybody follow? Be much bigger. You can see how you know how big the hemispheres are actually gonna get. They're gonna get huge. It's just one of the things that makes us different. You understand? So you got your cerebral hemispheres, you got diencephalon, you got midbrain, you got your pons, you got your medulla and you got your cerebellum. There's that review right there. How many times have I done it now already? Seven times, eight times? Probably around there. I count, I keep counting. So this is my cerebellum. Well, what's the cerebellum for? What's the job of the cerebellum? Coordinating. Coordination of complex motor movements along with balance and posture. Well, wait, wait, hold on. What cranial nerve is involved with balance? Cranial nerve 8, vestibular cochlear nerve. See that? So, guys, would it make sense that cranial nerve number 8 has fibers that are extending to the cerebellum? Yeah. Wait, doesn't, doesn't cranial nerve 8 extend elsewhere? Where else does it extend? To the what? To the diencephalon, right? Because all sensory information must be related to the thalamus. Thank you very much. But wait, isn't there another place where the cranial aid goes? Yeah, didn't I tell you? As it rises to go to the diencephalon. Check it out, guys. Why, why do I say it rises? Watch me. Everybody, watch me. Watch me. Cerebral hemispheres. They've got olfactory and optics nearby. They'll drop down to give connections to diencephalon. So cranial nerve one and cranial nerve two are somewhere up here, left and right. You got me? Where's cranial nerve three? Anybody know? Cranial nerve three and four, anybody know? Look, cranial nerve three is coming right out of here in the midbrain. They're coming right out, right out in the midline. Cranial nerve four is coming from the back. So there's cranial nerve four. Cranial nerve five is coming right off the pons. Cranial nerve six, seven, and eight. coming right at the level of the pons and the medulla. Six, seven, and eight. So you see where I said that eight will rise to the occasion, won't it? Huh. It's coming in here. It's going to rise up, drop fibers off to the cerebellum. Make sense? Yeah, because the cerebellum is responsible for what? Coordination of complex motor movements and balance and posture. It's going to continue to rise up and drop what? Fibers off to the midbrain because the midbrain has the inferior colliculi and the inferior colliculi need input from cranial nerve number eight because the inferior colliculi will integrate what they get from cranial nerve eight with the information that superior colliculi get from cranial nerve number two, the optic nerve, to integrate what? Sight and sound. So the corpora quadrigemini which are the superior and inferior colliculi, they integrate information from cranial nerve 2 with that of cranial nerve 8. You got me, guys? That's important.
That's important on the midbrain, the back side of the midbrain is where you find those structures. Those structures are going to integrate sight and sound. And sure enough, they're going to drop fibers off to cerebellum. Does that make sense, guys? Yeah, because they're getting input from sight and sound. And sure enough, if the cerebellum is responsible for coordination of complex motor movements and balance and posture, then you better believe it wants to know constantly where is your head in reference to the rest of your body. And it can only get that information from, from the eyes, from the ears, and then from what? The tension on the muscles. Think about this. You ever walk on a slope? Yeah? It's really severe slope. You ever notice it's very difficult? Why? Because we require that our shoulders and head be perpendicular to horizontal, not to the surface that we're walking on. So we'll walk like this, 